Uh, so, Cumberland, listen, for the next few weeks, uh, we'll be launching a brand new series called Charity Clarity. Uh, we're going to start a conversation about money and giving within the church. Now, now here's the deal. I, I know that that can be a very polarizing topic, and rightfully so. Uh, many people have different experiences, and some of them not so good around this idea of giving within the church. In fact, one of my good friends shared a story about when he was called into a meeting with his pastor about his personal giving record. Uh, the pastor had visited his home before and and therefore he concluded and then warned him that based on his lifestyle, where he lived, uh, the car he drove um, and, and whatever other factors that he perceived, he, he warned him that he should be giving more, at least more comparably to other prominent members of the church. Yeah, uh, of course, he no longer attends that church, right? But I'll tell you, there's an awful lot that's swirling around in that particular conversation. Like, like how much is enough, right? And, and, then, and then how do you determine that in terms of giving? Like, and maybe more importantly, who gets to determine that? Like, who actually decides how much is enough? And then if both sides are pointing at the other about being greedy with money, then which one is actually right? Like, which one is actually the greedy one, right? And then there's this interesting question that, that I've never actually heard discussed in a church ever, and that is simply, is there a such thing as giving too much? And if not, if there's no such thing as giving too much, then doesn't that mean that everybody should give more? And if the problem is everybody, then why is only the conversation being had with some people? Listen, I don't know. I, I, that, that's a lot to think about. I, I'm just I'm just asking questions about it all. And then and then and then I have to think about the most important question of all. Right. Is this money stuff a real legitimate concern that God has or is it just another empty argument amongst people? It's a lot to think about. And it sounds like that we could all use some charity clarity. Let me pray, and then we'll dive right in. Dear God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the opportunity um, to capture your heart and then align ours with yours. We want to be a pleasing to you, sir. We want to do your will. Uh, we want to honor you in every area of our lives, sir, including maybe even especially in the area of money, dear God. Help us to do that. We love you, dear sir. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, how much should I give? Um, let me just say that the traditional and perhaps the default answer to this question within the church, of course, is simply a tithe. Now, let me explain that because tithing is the practice of setting aside 10% of a person's financial increase to honor God for his provision. Uh, the presence of tithing amongst modern, modern believers, it emerges as an application from the Old Testament framework found in the Law of Moses. Uh, of course, when you look at that, uh, there, there's this agricultural economy. So this type of giving looked very different then from what we see today. Uh, in those days, tithing included grain, fruit, and other produce from the land, as well as an offering of the best from their flocks. In some cases, Money was used, but that was generally a method permitted for those who lived far away from the from the temple. So money was leveraged as a um, as a logistical option if they couldn't get the produce close enough to the temple. Nevertheless, tithing was was a clear requirement for all of Israel. It provided a sense of equity amongst the people to ensure that everyone could contribute in the same way. Uh, Deuteronomy explains this. If you have Bibles, turn to Deuteronomy 14. Let's pick up at verse 22. It says this, you must tithe all of your crops every year. Bring this tithe to eat before the Lord your God at the place he shall choose as his sanctuary. This applies to your tithes of grain, new wine, olive oil, and the firstborn of your flocks and herds. The purpose of tithing is to teach you always to put God first in your lives. 
I'll pause right there because some versions read um, to fear the Lord. Uh, others kind of say to honor him. But the sentiment remains the same. Tithing was leveraged as a discipling tool built into the law to help people relate to God appropriately. Uh, imagine the Israelites leaving slavery in Egypt and preparing to live in the freedom of the promised land. It's a place that's flowing with overwhelming abundance, as the Bible says, flowing with milk and honey. So understand there is real potential for them to forget who's the one who's really providing for them. Does, does that sound familiar to you? That This tendency for us to forget. And so we see that tithing, not only did it support the ministry of the priests, but it also served the purpose of grounding people in their dependence on God. Now, here's the deal, because some would argue that the tithe existed before the law of Moses and therefore is not subject to it. In Genesis 14, there is a specific reverence, reference to Abraham giving a tenth of everything to this priestly persona of Melchizedek. Consequently, people argue that whether we are under the old covenant or under the new, then tithing still remains as a binding expectation for believers today. But a closer examination reveals a distinction between Abraham's singular act of worship and the tithing that is required in the Mosaic law. Listen to this. The tithing of the practice of tithing traces back to Abraham, but the requirement of tithing is rooted specifically in the Mosaic law. Just because Abraham gave it doesn't mean that it was covenantally required of him. That requirement, that expectation didn't come into play until the law of Moses. And since New Testament believers are no longer bound by the law of Moses, the question is, should Christians continue tithing today? To answer that question, we should reflect back on the purpose. As was stated in Deuteronomy 14, the purpose of tithing is to teach you to put God first. So should you tithe? Well, my question would be, have you learned to put God first? <laughs> uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, most of the time in certain areas of my life, right? That, that's probably an honest answer that we would give. And if that's your answer, then most definitely you should embrace tithing as a discipline for your life. In the same way that you would embrace prayer as a personal discipline. In the same way that you might embrace something like fasting as a personal discipline. In the same way that you would embrace even Bible study. Um, beyond just reading the Bible, actual study, that you would embrace that as a discipline for your life. Tithing is a personal discipline that will cultivate even greater reverence for God in those who embrace it. Now, now here's the deal. Here's the deal. This is what I want you to see. Because while the Old Testament focused on a specific quantity of giving, 10%, the New Testament seems to emphasize a certain quality of giving. Uh, we start to see a new expectation emerge in the New Testament, one that characterizes those who have been transformed by the grace of God. Uh, this is not to say that believers did not continue to tithe faithfully in the early church. It just not just doesn't show up as a point of emphasis for them. Uh, in scripture. But, but then, of course, something else does. Something else emerges from the New Testament scripture as a priority, as, as, as something that's significant and important. Something else kind of rises to the top. And that something else is called generosity. It's called generosity. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 9. Listen to what it says here. Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. He says this, remember this, Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. 
I'll pause right there because this is an interesting account because he's writing to believers to encourage them to follow through on an opportunity to give. Uh, there is no expectation of a, of a specific amount here. There's only a nudge for everyone to be as generous as possible. So, so understand this is a shift in approach because it changes the driving force behind giving from religious duty to active faith. Hear this. Generosity calls us to grow from faithful giving to faith-filled giving. It calls us to grow from faithful giving to faith-filled giving. There's a difference between doing something to be faithful and doing it because you are filled with faith. Faithful can simply mean that you are consistent and dependable. Faith-filled implies that you go above and beyond what is expected. Uh, one of the ways that we know that we are exercising faith, that we're walking in it, is that it always comes with some level of risk. We know it by the discomfort that accompanies it. Understand, we walk by faith, but we can never coast by it. That's, that's not how it works. Faith reflects a type of surrender to God. In other words, the only reason I'm doing this, Lord, is because I trust you. It's not because I fully understand everything. It's not because I have all the details worked out. It's not because I've done the most appropriate math. The only reason I'm doing this is because I trust you. So in terms of giving, Paul describes this type of faith exercise as sowing generously. It's very interesting because he doesn't tell them what to give. He tells them how to give. And this is the overarching theme around money in the New Testament. The manner in which you give is of greater importance to God than the actual amount that you give. The manner in which you give is of greater importance to God than the actual amount that you give. So here's the question. How much faith does it take for you to give? Listen, not how much do you give. I, I'm not asking about the amount. I, that, that's a completely different question. I'm asking about your faith. Does your giving accurately demonstrate your current level of trust in God? Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. But listen to me, faith always calls for a stretch. It compels us to do more than what is obvious. This is significant because this type of faith expression allows us to become more of a reflection of the God in whom we claim we trust. We are to be generous so that the world knows that God is generous. Paul continues to explain this in verse 10. He says, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. So listen to what he's saying here. Uh, God is literally setting us up to be generous. He promises to underwrite our generosity for his glory. He, he promises to, to like support it, to underscore it, to underwrite it, to ensure, to guarantee that we are able to be generous for his glory. Now, now let me be clear with that because understand I'm not interested in, in any of this prosperity teaching stuff, like um, the, the prosperity um, leaning. It teaches that your giving is really about your own glory, not his. It, it teaches that giving is really about you elevating yourself. It's about what you can gain, what you can become, what, what you can get for yourself. Um, it's not about his glory. That teaching is about our glory. But scripture makes no promises that if you give, you will become wealthy. It makes no promises that if you give, your problems will go away. It only says that if you give filled with faith, then you will become more like him. Generous. Generous. 
And if that's not a value to you to become more like him, then you may have missed the whole point of salvation in the first place, right? Now, now here's the deal. One other point that I want to give you, and, and I think this one is extremely significant because uh, Paul also warns the church. He, he tells them to not give under compulsion. In other words, he says, don't allow yourself to be manipulated into giving. And the reason for this is because if you've been tricked into giving, if you've been deceived into giving, if you've been bullied or even shamed into giving, then at that point, your giving stops being worship. It's, it's no longer worship. At that point, your reverence is not for God. It's for the one who manipulated you. I hope you can understand that. And this is the type of perversion that we see happening in churches around this topic of money over and over again. It's one of the reasons people become so jaded by church. It's one of the reasons there's this lack of church, this lack of trust within the church as it relates to money is because there's this sense of manipulation as it relates to, to what we do with giving. But understand this, giving becomes a reflection of the fear of man rather than an expression of the love of God. That's what the problem is. It's more about um, what people think and what their opinions are and how you look in a certain way. It has nothing to do with our worship, our expression of our love for God. But Paul gives a strategic counter for this potential trap. He writes this in, in 2 Corinthians 9, 7. He says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a chill forgiver. Again, the emphasis is not on what you give, it's on how you give. It says that God loves a cheerful giver. Uh, that is a real measure for your giving. Do you give cheerfully? Do you give with eagerness, like with, with excitement, with, with hope in your heart, with a smile on your face, or... Or do you give begrudgingly? Do you do it, but, but you don't really want to do it, but you do it. You feel a certain way about having to do it. It's kind of like um, paying taxes, right? You, you do it because you're supposed to do it, right? But you, you're not really happy about it. You're not excited about it, right? And in so many ways, we bring that mindset into how we give to God. So my question is, what is the attitude in which you give to God? What, what is the attitude? For some, the, what might be the problem, because in your heart, you don't even give to God. For some people, you give to a church or you give to a ministry or even to a pastor and you measure the amount you give against the flaws that they have. And because they will always be imperfect, you carry a built-in excuse, justification, to not be generous. And then we have a tendency to call that wisdom. Listen, I get it. I get it. There, there is good reason to be cautious. There is good reason to be careful because everybody ain't doing the Lord's work. Let me, let me just tell you that from jump. I, I get that completely, but it doesn't change the fact that we are called to be generous. And generosity always begins with joy. It begins with joy. This is why the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Listen, he's paying attention to how you give, not just what you give. At Cumberland, this is our reason for having what we call joy boxes, as opposed to, to offering plates, which you see traditionally. Um, it's not some gimmick. It's not some trend that we come up with. It's a, it, for us, it's theological because it's a consistent reminder that there is a specific way that God wants us to give. And that is generously with joy in our hearts. 
So, so when we say joy boxes, you hear everybody say woohoo because we want to demonstrate that we're excited for this moment. We, we, we look forward to this moment. We view this as another way to worship a deserving God. We give generously with joy. Because if that's what God is paying attention to, then that's what we should all be paying attention to as well. Which leaves me with the conclusion. Because here's the deal. If I expect you to walk in faith, then of course I need to do the same, right? So, so I'm going to say to you what I see emerging from the text, which might actually be counter to everything that's ever been taught in terms of church growth, right? Uh, but remember, there is a new standard of giving. Here's my conclusion. If you aren't currently experiencing the joy of generosity, then you need to change your giving. If you aren't experiencing the joy that comes with generosity, then you need to change your giving. If you aren't experiencing what God intends for you to experience, then you are doing something wrong. Something is off. Something is not the way it's supposed to be. In terms of money, then without the joy of generosity, your giving is either dictated by greed or fear. It's certainly not coming from faith. Listen, maybe it once did. Maybe it did once before in your life a long time ago, um, but, but understand as circumstances change, then so does the faith requirement. Sometimes to get to a place of joyful and generous giving, sometimes you need to increase the amount that you give. See, see, understand, sometimes you aren't experiencing the joy because you aren't exercising the faith. Sometimes we give out of duty. Sometimes we give out of tradition. We give because we, ha we have it to give, right? You, you have more than enough, so from that abundance, you give some. Pay attention to that. You have more than enough, so from that abundance, you give some. But understand, if you've been doing that, then that manner of giving may no longer require faith from you. It, in other words, it's too easy for you to do, which means you never get to experience the fullness of joy because you never exercise the fullness of faith in your giving. So maybe, maybe the solution is to increase your giving amount. But not only that, there are times um, maybe situations, maybe even for certain people, that in order to reach a place of genuine joy, maybe you need to decrease the amount that you give. Listen, if you are currently giving grudgingly, if you're giving, but but honestly, in your heart, you're you're complaining about how much that is. Like if if you've developed some sense of entitlement and you carry expectations based on how much you give, then understand your giving no longer qualifies as generosity. It it no longer qualifies. Listen, you've attached strings to it. And those strings are strangling the joy out of your giving. Maybe you should consider adjusting your giving to a place where you can genuinely give freely without expecting anything in return, without feeling a certain way about it, that you can give freely to experience the joy that God intends to accompany it. Listen, I've been on both sides of that equation in my journey, having to make adjustments, sometimes up, sometimes down, in my wallet to ensure alignment with God in my heart. I've, I've been on both sides of it. And so here's the deal. I'm not here to tell you what to give. That's between you and the Lord. My job my role, my goal is to help you be ready to stand before him 
to answer to the one who has been so joyfully generous to each and every one of us. So much so that we are all without excuse. See, whether you choose to increase your giving or whether you choose to decrease it, remember the goal. Remember the standard is joyful generosity. God is not just looking at how much we give. He's looking at how we give. And his expectation is that we are to be cheerful, joyful, generous givers. It matters to God how you give, not just what you give. Now, next week, um, we're going to talk a bit more about whether you should um, increase your amount or decrease that amount uh, because there are serious implications for both. Understand there is a war waging for our hearts and so much of it happens on the battleground of our finances, right? And if we don't consider the right things, then what will happen is we'll make the wrong adjustments and cause our hearts to drift even further away from the Lord. So that's where we're going for next week. But for right now, I think it's time for us to remember just how generous God has been to us. You know, scripture nudges us and encourages us to give, but the only reason we can give is because someone has already given to us. If you have your sacraments, I want to invite you to the table of the Lord. Well, Jesus is with his disciples and he's reminding them of his own generosity. He's with them and they're observing the Passover and Jesus begins to explain how he gave the ultimate gift of all. He takes the bread and he says, this bread represents my body, which has been broken for you. If you believe that, take the bread and eat. Likewise, Jesus takes the cup and he says, this cup, it represents my blood that has been poured out for you. See, see, when Jesus gave generously, it was costly. It cost him his life. He shed his blood to cover our debts, to cover our sin. He paid the price for all of our mistakes. That is the most generous act in all of creation. If you believe it, and if you believe he did it just for you, take the cup and drink. And he says, as often as you remember this, as often as you come to this table, you eat this bread and you drink from this cup, you receive my generosity so that you can be generous to others. Let me pray. God, thank you so much. Thank you, God, that you have given us a gift um, that we cannot repay. We cannot repay it, Lord. But I thank you, Lord. Um, the gift didn't just um, place something in our possession. It changed us. It transformed us, dear God. And now we can become generous just like you. I thank you, Lord, that we would live out of the reality of that transformation, that we would live out of the presence of that gift, and that we would be your people reflecting your generosity to a needy world. Help us to do that, sir. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.